And uh, let's let's now bring in Kahal. Hello, everybody. There you go. <laughs> Welcome in. How's so, it uh, what? It's it's going great. Um, you've been listening backstage. What have you What have you been thinking about this anthropology talk, uh, BS, and uh, and uh, you know all with the substrate of rethinking economics? What's uh, what, you know what, what are you thinking there? Yeah, yeah. I was I was a massive fan of of Graeber. Um, you know, not not mm. not just for bullshit jobs, but obviously his his first his book, first book that really made a splash was Debt. Right, Debt: The First Five Thousand Years, which yeah. is obviously something that fits really well with what you do steve right uh because it was just yeah about it does money doesn't emerge from sort of a fictitious situation where you have a farmer with an apple and another farmer with a banana and they're, they're just trading right it's uh much more complex the history of money and uh, i think that was one because it was released in 2011 right uh so if you're talking about rethinking economics i think that was that was the year i started my degree in economics and um i think i read it before i started the degree but it was it was something one of the major books i could say that like just completely revolutionized how i thought and told me that basically what we were learning about money was uh or what we were what i was about to learn about money was basically nonsense nice nice yeah. okay uh well, um, I'm going to give you a choice here, and it's not usually a typical thing we do with guests, but I'm, I'm thinking, do you, do you feel that we should jump right into the behavioral aspects and kind of hit um, uh, Steve's question head on about, you know, your work in, in, in micro and whether there is a role to play for behavior economics? Do you think that's... Uh, where, yeah, you know yeah. where we, we should start. I think yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting. Um, I mean, I was actually just reading um, your your latest book, uh, Steve, the uh, New Economics and Manifesto. Um, is that the latest one? Sometimes mm -hmm. I can't keep up with you, but um, <laughs> it's it's the latest published. I've actually just finished yeah. literally a, late, a new one, which hopefully come out later this year. That's the economics building economics from the top from down. The top down. But that's yeah. that won't be published. It won't be published, hopefully published this year. I'm just not sure how fast the, it'll get edited over here. Yeah, it's pretty slow, that whole process. I'm in a similar stage mm. with mm. the book I'm writing as well. So it can, I think it's going to yeah. be like a year until it actually gets published. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, so tell us about yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, sorry, the book or, or my perspective on, on the question of... <laughs> Of behavior like I'd really your perspective like to... on the question that yeah yeah, we'll, yeah we'll yeah. get back to the book afterwards yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um so so yeah I mean I think behavioral economics th there's really lots of different types of behavioral economics I think and there's what was sometimes called behaviorist um I think that was in the tradition of people like Herbert Simon which was supposed to be a more realistic approach to human behavior um but then there's like kind of modern behavioral economics which is much more mathematical and it's much more of a modification of the the neoclassical approach to have you know so you've got like a an individual maximizing utility subject to a budget constraint you know they're solving a, a problem but they're no longer rational in the sense that there's some bias you know maybe they uh, they can't predict the future very well um, because they're like they're hungry and they're at the supermarket so they buy a load of like cookies and stuff uh, and so there's some kind of bias some mathematical tweak in the um, in the function which then translates into a, a result you know buying an amount that maybe isn't rational once they get get down to eating it they realize that they've made a mistake so i think that's a it's a it's it's kind of good that economists realize that people aren't completely rational in the sense that they defined it but i think it, it was a much more watered down version of what people like herbert simon had in mind which i think was a completely different yeah. approach to human behavior um so i mean i, th I think certainly the neoclassical model is wrong whether you want to follow the kind of the biases approach sometimes called the biases and heuristics approach where there are just mistakes and i think one of the things that you get when you you believe that people are making mistakes uh, like being hungry uh, when you go to the supermarket and buying too much is called projection bias, is um, that you just need to correct them, right? You just need to correct those mistakes and then you can sort of, with minimal intervention in terms of policy and government spending or whatever, 
uh, you, you, you can actually correct people's decisions and then you're back to the land where the consumer is king and uh, you can fix most major problems through things like that, including major problems like like climate change. So, I mean, that was that was the essence of nudge, right? The the nudge approach, which stemmed from this this idea of behavioral economics. And I, I don't think that that really holds up to scrutiny um, any, any longer. I think if you're going to do behavioral economics, you need a much more comprehensive revision of, of how you how you model and think about human behavior. Um, and I say that I want to make the disclaimer that I do not have the answer to how you do that. But I just uh, think it's something that needs to be done. This this is where I come in as my criticism of um, of the behavioral economics in general. And that is that <laughs> it ended up being you know, like 179 deviations from rationality type stuff. And I, I remember just listening to one presentation and thinking, if I was, I know how a neoclassical economist would react to this. Oh, there's just too many bloody deviations. Let's just assume rationality. So in, in that sense, it tends to be, ends up being part of what uh, Lakatos called the protective belt of a, of a paradigm. Uh, it lets you uh, maintain the core belief of rationality, modified on the outside to deflect criticism, but the core belief in what they call rational behavior continues. Of course, the great flaw in neoclassical rational behavior is that if you told an ordinary person who hadn't done an economics degree, uh, what the defin what what the definition was of rational behavior, then you would um, have people saying, "Oh, what word have you defined? Oh, you mean somebody who's prophetic? You mean Nostradamus or Jesus? Because their definition of rational is has the capacity to predict the future accurately, and that's you know in, in that sense we shouldn't be saying there are deviations. That we say that's crazy. That is not rational behavior at all." And you've distorted the meaning of the word to hang on to your paradigm. That's fascinating, Steve. That's really fascinating as a, uh, because, you know, way back in, in ancient times where you had prophets and you had uh, sages, um, that's really interesting. But we have um, modern technology and disciplines and, um, like disciplines like economics, where we can rely on other tools that describe the way um, these complex systems work. Mike, um, <clears throat> do you think there's hope for uh, a, a synthesis between micro and macro, or are, are they are they um, going to develop, or should they develop in a vacuum at this point? I guess it depends on what you mean by a synthesis. I think um, the old idea of the micro foundations of macroeconomics kind of comes from an atomistic point of view, methodological individualism, linear thinking, linear models, that the behavior of the whole is simply the sum of the behavior of the parts, right? So that's your mm -hmm. superposition property of, of linear systems. So macro just is sort of an afterthought. It just falls out at the end. What you really need to do is is uh, understand the micro stuff. Um, and that's, of course, what Steve is arguing against, right? Uh, that systems are nonlinear and you cannot analyze them that way. The sum of the behavior of the whole is more than the sum of the behavior of the parts. You have to look at the interactions and, and, and what have you. Now, having said that, I personally believe that um, uh, as long as we're doing it, taking a nonlinear approach and looking at the interactions, it's perfectly fine to say, all right, at the micro level at various places in the in the system, what are people really doing rather than uh, assuming some kind of rational behavior or uh, providing a very, very simple uh, representation of what they might be doing? Are they anchoring and adjusting? Are they present biased and what have you? And then you can, by the way, you can, <clears throat> when you get that nailed down correctly, in a manner that would be consistent with what's found in laboratory experiments, for example, or in the field by behavioral economists, where they would say, yeah, that's what we found. A lot of people do that. They anchor and adjust, let's say. Um, the question becomes, you know, um, so I don't know, Dick Thaler, somebody like that who's advocating, well, you know, um, get to get people to save more for their retirement, have them uh, save more of their raise rather than their present salary. Well, let's try that on the model. And let's see with this holistic, all these interactions and feedbacks and so forth, is that really a leverage point? 
right? Because we've got the we've got the human decision making right, right, at least as far as we know from laboratory experiments, what have you. We're taking a nonlinear approach, right? And but we're looking if we want to change the behavior of the system and make it make the airplane fly better, you got to redesign it, right? Where are our leverage points? It may or may not mm -hmm. be a leverage point correcting these these biases. So I think that's where kind of all this all meshes together and where we might have something to say with our simulation tools. Mm -hmm. And you also got social classes as well, which I think that's the neoclassic have abolished the thought about social classes. And we, we don't think we have working class these days and middle class and capitalists, but we do. And we need to look yeah. at the social behavior as you know, individual behave within a social context. And, uh, and and that's the thing which we've lost, courtesy of the neoclassicals. We need to bring it in. And we need to bring Carl in because we're cutting you out of the conversation, mate. So <laughs> It's fun. I don't know. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned class because I think one of the useful things that has come out of what you might call mainstream um, uh, behavioral economics is uh, the work of um, Melanathan uh, on, on the effect of poverty on decisions and it's mm. pretty clear from that that uh when you have when you don't have very much money uh your decision making is quite severely impaired um and so they look at people who have like um they look at i think one of the one of the most famous studies looked at um indian farmers who had very volatile income and they looked at them kind of uh just just before they got they got a windfall and and just after and they found that their sort of decision making was just so much worse just before just because of the pressure that being in poverty puts on your brain um now that is i think i think my microphone's peaking a bit uh, i think that i think that is something that people maybe you know we've proved it with statistics maybe if economists had spoken to people who'd actually been in poverty they would have learned it a long time ago right because it's uh it's something that anyone who has has had very little money will tell you something along those lines but it's definitely useful knowledge and i think it speaks to this macro versus micro point right because it's one thing to say that you know we we should correct behavior on a micro level with with nudge but it's another thing to ask okay well what are the macro structures that enable people to make uh good decisions and, and to kind of do their best and you know be able to be rational uh you know so to speak and and that would that would be something like do people have enough money and i think that would be a kind of macro way of correcting that bias i have a, a colleague or an ex-colleague called uh, Stuart mills who has been writing about this type of approach to behavioral economics and how you might want to think about the the structures of the macro economy and what kind of behavior they create instead of just looking at individual decisions and how you tweak them to be to be correct can you give us an example yeah. of some of the structures that you're referring to in macro uh that that would be determinants of behavior or influences in behavior can you give it a, a couple examples um, well, well, I mean, like the income distribution would be one, right? Like, so I think, like, if you're if you're thinking about income distribution, then that would have a direct effect on poverty, uh, in the in the way I was just describing. So, if you have people who, you know, let's say just for the sake of argument, a universal basic income that's a floor under which people cannot fall, um, mm -hmm. then the the effects of poverty uh, are going to be reduced massively or completely eliminated the effects of poverty on decision making right and so that's going to be like i don't know if you, what you could call it like a macro nudge or something mm -hmm. interesting i want to know so, uh, uh, by my vote in this room um how many of you guys have listened to that davos speech with javier millet the argentinian libertarian i, I that, that was it, yeah. <laughs> that was quite interesting oh, um, life's, life's so short life's, too, life's short. too short yeah 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 you know what, what about you mike yeah 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 i, I haven't i haven't listened to it either but i love his hairdo you know yeah and his glasses <laughs> the way they sit in there but okay anyways we're, we're just... um, can it can it we're, we're almost almost breaking a thousand viewers today and, and i i just have to say that um it's uh it's looking great and it's a great turnout for steve i want to see as many people as possible um, support the channel, comment. Um, hey, we could send them over to your Patreon page too, right, Steve? <laughs> and and Mike's YouTube <laughs> channel, help. and and you know, let's uh, let's let's support let's support this great initiative. So, anyways, mm. Um, mm. 
I don't know if that's a viable the... response, I guess, in terms of me bringing up the Argentinian pre uh, president, but there is a, a, a growing aspect of um, libertarianism in economics and or in um, in political systems. There's a growing reality of nationalism growing throughout the world. Um, and they would have dramatic effects on on macroeconomics. Would, would that not be the case, Steve? Well, they, they would, because this is what you're not saying. It's not individual behavior. It's it's crazy theories. And like if we're going to go from neoclassical to Austrian, we're chasing one crazy, crazy theory for another. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back to watch the Austrian ex experience in in um, uh, Argentina. I mean, one obvious, Argentina's massively screwed up economy and has been for a century. So I can understand people going for an extreme solution uh, in that situation. Uh, but you know, let's see what happens next. My feeling is there'll be a huge drop in aggregate demand, massive poverty. Uh, and, and there's so many elements like the understanding of money in the in Austrian is even worse than neoclassicals have, and that's that's difficult, but they've managed it. So uh, sh shutting down the central bank, all these sorts of things, you know, I, I want to sit back and see what happens in many ways, uh, rather than commenting. But I'll, I'll I'll force myself to listen to that speech at some stage. I was going to actually come back to Carl's point earlier. Carl, first of all, how do I print it? Do, do I pronounce your name Carl or do I just say Carl? It's Carl. Carl. I never know. It's an Irish name, so you can say it in an Irish accent. Carl. Carl. Oh, that <laughs> helps immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have had one, two doses of poverty in my life. One very recently from making the mistake of uh, doing a family loan, which I now highly recommend against. Um, but anyway, mm. I realized one thing about that when, when being in poverty. The rich people think the poor don't think about money at all. They're completely wrong. Mm. The poor think about money almost all the bloody time. They've got no damn choice. How can I make what I've got stretch as far as I go? So that's one element where, you know, it, it, it's the opposite of people who are wealthy think, oh, I'm wealthy because I, I know about money, whereas the poor don't think about it. Bullshit. Um, the poor aren't in a position to, to do anything about it, which is half the problem. Um, but the other thing is, have you ever read that the book by, um, oh, dear, George Orwell? Um, called Keep the Aspidistra Flying. No, have you read not it? that one, no. Not that one, no. <laughs> okay. Ha you have, okay, Get, have a read. It's, it's one of his great under-recognized novels, and it's much more a novel than most of the other works. I mean, Brave New... Oh, sorry, 1984 and, um, and Animal Farm and so on are very, in a sense, very stylized. Uh, but Keep the Aspidistra Flying is about a poet who never makes money, is always poor, and then comes up with some idea for a poem and through the book the poem gets delivered over time and part of his point is that uh, he's, he's responding to a newspaper article where somebody criticized the poor by saying look if i was living on that much money i could survive i could i, I could manage to buy the right things and i could survive and his attitude was bullshit he said if you're that poor you want distractions from the shit world you're in you're going to go and buy alcohol you're going to go buy drugs you're going to smoke cigarettes you know what something that gives you a bit of pleasure in the misery of being poor and and then he gets wealthy and then he's actually sending up a plant the aspidistra which he which apparently is a very common plant decorative plant in um, in england at the time he wrote let's have a read it's it really is a, a well-written uh, fictionalized account of the experience of somebody in being poor and i'm just, Creative says being poor isn't fun. I don't recommend it either. But in that in that situation, um, you 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 have to behave crazily, or you will go crazy. And that's part of the story of keep the aspirators to flying. I actually think I know that passage that you're talking about, even though I haven't read the book, because he talks okay. about uh, when you're okay. poor, there's always something to tempt you. You know, you, uh, a rich man can happily sit with a breakfast of rivita and orange juice or something, but uh, when you're poor, you can't. I think is that is that the same passage that you're talking about? Pretty much, it it, yeah. it comes out of the same idea. Obviously, yeah. yeah. So the way I said it wasn't know, quite George Orwell esque, but you know. No, well, you have to work work on your phrasing a bit there. Yeah. <laughs> Look, Carl, let's so, talk a bit about how you and I met and your background, because mm -hmm. I think it's very important for people mm -hmm. to know where rethinking economics and unlearning economics came from. And of course, you're in Manchester, and there may be a story about Manchester that you don't know. So, 
Hit us with yeah. the history. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I called this on my YouTube channel. I called it debunking economics versus unlearning economics. Um, so maybe we can discuss what those two mean. But I, I, um, I actually started to read debunking economics in my first year of university. Now I was mm -hmm. aware of it, um, but I think because it was about 500 pages long, I was a bit scared of it for a while. And then I finally decided to take it on. But um, I, I, yeah, it was, um, I decided to, whoops. So during my first year at Manchester, uh, there were a couple of things going on. Firstly, it was 2011, like I mentioned earlier. So we were still out of mm -hmm. the, you know, fresh out of the 2008 financial crisis, which nobody had really seen coming. Uh, it, it was a massive shock. It was, uh, uh, you know, obviously a horrible, dreadful thing. Uh, and we just weren't really learning about it in our classrooms. And uh, we weren't learning about it. And to be honest, the, what we were learning was kind of just a rehash of A-level economics. So it wasn't particularly relevant or challenging in the first year. And so I think that led me to start this blog called Unlearning Economics, right? Which explains my handle on, uh, on, on the internet, which persists to this day. But I, I just uh, started writing about what I was learning and how, how inadequate it was and how unsatisfied I was with the fact that we were just drawing you know, ISLM curves when, uh, while the Eurozone crisis was raging, I remember Greece literally being on fire. And uh, we, yes. we just, it wasn't even mentioned, it wasn't even mentioned in macroeconomics. I mean, I can't, you know, it's, it's, it's actually absurd to say it out loud that the class would be so rigid and theoretical and uh, responsive to the, to the, what was going on outside, outside the lecture hall. But that's the way it was. So I was writing this blog and one of the things I actually did, which is probably how we kind of met, uh, Steve was that I I did a chapter by chapter write up of debunking economics as I was writing it or as as I was remember it, sorry on mm. my blog yeah so I did I did this so I went I really kind of went in depth on the on the book and uh, yeah got got to know every chapter very well but it was um it was good because I think you know obviously I I really I really enjoyed the book but also I think sometimes it helped my education as well because I think one thing that economists sometimes miss is that sometimes the best way to learn about something is actually to critique it and think about its limitations, right? Because when you get presented yeah. with all these models in a, in a mainstream degree, they're just like, here it is, here it is, this is, you know, this is economics, right? Uh, solve it. And then you get an answer. And that's like, and there's no, talk, no discussion of like the scope of the model, what you might call boundary conditions, right? Um, yep. The type of thing you'd have in, usually in the physical sciences. And th there's just nothing like that. And then, so you're sort of left thinking, okay, so, so either you're one of those people who just sort of goes along with it, you know, uh, uh, whether through inertia or through actual belief, or, or you just sort of don't really know where it applies and, and where it doesn't. Um, but when, once you start to think about critiques of the models, then you realize, oh, okay, so this is, uh, maybe there are a couple of situations where it could, it could apply. Um, I mean, I think those are few and far between for the undergraduate models, but maybe there are some out there that, uh, where, where they can be used. But, um, and, and then there are places where it doesn't apply and this is why and that helps you to understand the assumptions right and what what they mean yeah i mean i um uh i um you know got into well pardon me i've got a i've got a I've got michael hudson calling so pardon me take me out for a second I have a chat to michael hang on quite literally <laughs> so Kahal, i i wanted to know can you give a couple of examples of <laughs> of um I guess, well, I mean, you've already given examples of um, kind of the limited utility of undergraduate models, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're, they're, they're so, like you, you're even speculative to the point to say that it's questionable whether or not, oh, what's this? 256 likes, 2,407 watching. Wow, this is great. This is wow. really good. This is really good. Yeah, yeah. Keep up the good work. Maybe it's just because we asked, right? You know, <laughs> we threw it out to the algorithm, and 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 it was uh, it it was the right combination of words. Thank you, Google. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I guess I'm looking for a little bit something a little bit more concrete with your work. I, I I'm looking for something um, uh, something that excites you that I can tease out of your book that you can share with the audience. Uh, or, or your research what what are what are you working on that's exciting and that's that's very novel unique and 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 and, and very you 
Um, I mean, I mean, so let, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the book I'm writing. So the, um, the working title I've got for it at the moment is uh, Why We're Getting Poorer. Uh, and it's in intended to be a fairly, in, in the same manner as my YouTube channel is, a fairly accessible, uh, but also hopefully um, rigorous, um, although I don't really like that word because mainstream economists use it too much. But, you know, hopefully a kind of credible and, and evidence-driven um, and theoretically grounded approach to a lot of the problems that we seem to be facing in our economy, you know, since, uh, well, for, for a long time, but since the 2008 financial crisis, which is my adult life, it seems like we had that crisis, you know, and then we had like austerity um, in the UK, especially uh, also elsewhere across Europe, right? The Eurozone crisis. Um, then we had, of course, things like <clears throat> Brexit and things like Trump and things like the rise of the far right across the world um, and coronavirus. And we've had, you know, massive inequality um, and, you know, the fallout of uh, trade deals and globalization and uh, climate change always going on in the background. So, you know, all of these things uh, seem to be coming to a head. And I'm not saying the book addresses every single thing I've just mentioned individually, but what it does do is it tries to take aim at like some of the some of those issues, like some of the inequalities in our economy, um, some of the major markets that I think are failing people. Um, the cost of living crisis is, is, is another one, right? Uh, and, um, you know, things like housing and just try to explain them from what you could call a heterodox perspective in the sense that it's not really a mainstream neoclassical perspective, <clears> but, you know, just in, in plain language. Um, and in the way, in a way that you know, is hopefully trying to push for some kind of serious, radical solutions to those problems, not just not just uh, you know tweaking around the edges. Would you say it's more of a post-Keynesian approach then? I mean, I would consider myself a, a post-Keynesian slash behaviorist slash institutional economist, which sounds like a lot, except that if you know those schools, you'll know that they all sort of fit together quite nicely, because I think. Yeah. One of the major things, yeah, yeah. So one of the major things about post Keynesians, which struck me, which I really liked when I, for instance, read Debunking Economics and you got onto talking about money, uh, same for David Graeber's debt, is when they ask, you know, how, how's money created? How does money work? Uh, then they just say, okay, well, let's, let's go to a bank. Let's go, <laughs> let's go and look at a bank. Let's go and look at the balance sheets of banks. Let's learn mm. how to do accounting, right? Uh -huh. And it's like, I mean, it, it's, it sort of infuriates me when I think that there are people who would actively choose not to do that, even though they had the option. Um, and they're also like arguably in the mainstream of the discipline, right? But it's like, that just seems like such an obvious approach, but that's also the institutional approach is to look at history and the institutions, obviously. And, and so that's why I think it meshes quite well with post Keynesian economics. Um, and so that's, my, the book is in a way very historical, right? Uh, that's, that's the type of approach I like to take. Mike, that's that's like Mike, 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 Mike could come in just after the, mm. but that point is about observing and seeing how things work and then building a systemic analysis of it. That system dynamics orientation and people, I've, I remember saying quite a few times with people saying to me during the financial crisis, look, don't economists study the Great Depression? Don't they know what caused it? And I said no and no. They do not do the historical work. They don't do the field research. In fact, they disparage both of them. And I've been in economic departments which have voted to shut down hist economic history and shut down history of economic thought. So it's actually not based on observation at all. It's armchair logic. Mike. So, so I thought I'd <clears throat> excuse me, uh, weigh in and, and talk about a game we play in system dynamics that kind of ties into a lot of what's being discussed here, including the, the notion of sort of a Cahal's idea of sort of a macroeconomic nudge and some of the things I talked about prior about the redesigning the airplane. It's a well-known game. Anybody can get a hold of it and play it if they want. It's called the beer game. And uh, this is often the first thing that we do in system dynamics is we introduce people to the beer game. And what is it? Well, there's a it's a it's a board game traditionally. There are electronic versions, but the best way to play it, it's a board game. And uh, there are four stations at on the game board. You, you roll it out on a big a conference table. There's a retailer, a wholesaler, a distributor, and a factory. It's a supply chain. And uh, <clears throat> the, the product is beer. Beer is, uh, cases of beer are pennies or bingo chips. And everybody starts with 12 in their inventory. The retailer, the wholesaler, the distributor, and the factory. 
And uh, you're, the only thing you have to do in each round of the game is decide how much beer you want to order from your supplier. Your supplier is the person who sits to your right. So the retailer orders from the wholesaler, the wholesaler from the distributor, the distributor from the brewery or the factory. The factory doesn't order from anybody, they make it, okay? So all you have to do, how much do I want to order from my supplier, okay? Everybody who plays the game, absolutely everybody generates the exact same behavior. You get a, a giant um, rundown in your inventory of beer and then a giant overreaction and then it eventually settles down. You get a big oscillation and the oscillation gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you move up the supply chain towards the factories. It's called a bullwhip effect in, in supply chain management. Okay, now what's so interesting about this relative to our conversation? Well, the first thing is after you play the game, oh, the retailer gets their orders, by the way, from a deck of cards from the, the game facilitator. <laughs> so you ask, okay the uh, wholesale distributor of the factory, what do you think the order pattern was on those cards? Because people were ordering 200 cases of beer from their supplier, whatever. And uh, they'll draw what happened to them, a, a big oscillation. That, In other words, the deck of cards caused the oscillation. Okay, and then mm. you show them. The orders were four, 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 and then eight, 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 a straight line. And people were ordering 200, 400 cases of beer, you know, wholly overreaction, Batman. Okay. So then it's like, well, why is it? You're blaming the deck of cards. You're blaming external factors. You're not looking to the design of the system. Everybody plays it the same way, whether you're a CEO, a famous professor, or a high school kid, <clears throat> because the system is designed to oscillate. Now, Within the structure of a system that oscillates, some people really oscillated and others did, but not so bad. So why is that? And so John Sturman, a colleague of mine at MIT, did a study. People were recording their decisions, okay? And he built a little model that fit everybody's data really well. He had, he had like 50, 70 different people who's in the same model was fit to the, the different data sets representing their decisions to order beer, and it fit very well. And John said, well, if you're playing this game, what are you doing? You have to look at what are what orders are you receiving from the person to your left or the deck of cards if you're the retailer? Uh, how much inventory do you have? How many pennies do you have? And how many would you like to have? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what have you already ordered, but it isn't here yet? Because it's you got the orders have to go upstream, and then the beer comes downstream. There's a big delay. And the cognitive biases where, where a behavioral economist could come in is there were, there were uh, two main factors that were causing this giant overreaction. One was, the main was, people forgot the supply line. They had already ordered beer, but it wasn't here yet. And they ordered, ordered some more. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's as though they had gone to a restaurant and ordered a drinks and a meal. And the waiter came back with the drinks and you look down and you don't see your steak yet and you order the meal again. <laughs> no mm. one would do that because they remember I've already ordered the meal. There's just a delay before the chef prepares it. But people were reordering the beer because it hadn't come yet. <laughs> and then the other one was yeah. people would mm. jump in orders from the deck of cards or from their, uh, from their customer downstream and they would overreact like, oh my gosh. And they, you know, so, so you had a bunch of, so then you get into, okay, how could you, um, at your position in the game, given it's going to oscillate anyway, what could you do? Well, you need information about the supply line to remember that or what have you. And then at the macro level, the macro nudges, what can we do to redesign this overall airplane that's going to oscillate anyway? Even if you play well and you, you sort of tap down the cognitive biases, the overreactions and forgetting and whatever, it's still going to oscillate but not as bad, but can we do something to fix that? Can we redesign how the system's structured, reduce the delays, change the information flows and what have you? So it's quite an insightful game. It's one of these things where people say years later, yeah, I took your course. I don't remember any of that programming stuff or whatever, but I remember playing that damn beer game. <laughs> <laughs> and that shows the structural and just, sorry, yeah. that shows the structural and systemic nature of a capitalist system. And that's what 
system dynamics is much better at than behavioral because behavioral focus has focused. Carl can talk about ways that it might be changing, mm. but it focused on how an individual's behavior is rational or irrational given a set of you know costs and mm. and utilities. Whereas the real thing, it's a system of, uh, of, of processes and the interaction of systems gets in the way. So my favorite example of that was actually an academic paper I did with a, a friend in, in Perth, Max Kumaro. Max was an expert on commercial real estate. And what he found was that the commercial real estate would over, uh, booms and busts were common, of course, in commercial real estate. And I did a mathematical model of the process that he had. And what I found was the way to stop the oscillations and to get the supply of commercial uh, real estate to match the demand much more closely was to increase the bureaucratic delays in approving the pro uh, projects, <laughs> which was counterintuitive. Mm. If you sped it up, you got more instability. Oh, my. I don't like that. Mm. Steve, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I, I, I want to critique. I want to <laughs> offer a criticism, Mike, though, because I was following you on that beer game, mm -hmm. right? But I don't know if the analogy of of the waiter analogy is the right analogy, right? I mean, you didn't get your steaks; so you ordered another steak. But I'm an order taker. I was in supply chain, and I was a category manager for a billion dollar um, company. Well, I mean, operating company called Cisco in the United States. They're all over the United States, okay. North America's biggest. Yeah. Yep. So we would have inventory replenishment systems. And so this is exactly coming out from behind the desk. And so it, they were not they were not complicated calculations, but you needed to take into account only a few things, a delivery lead time, you needed to know perishability, you needed to know several several things. Yeah. Now, if you're a restaurant tour, which just by definition, if you're talking about beer, you're talking about uh, like an, a fine establishment, uh, uh, of, of, of an opening in, uh, in, in a restaurant of sorts, right? And so the staff or whoever's ordering it is going to order more based on the number of people that are walking through the door. So they're not consuming it, they're selling it. So that's not a good analogy with the steak because you, yeah, you can only eat one steak. But if I consistently get more and more people coming in, yeah, but, and if it's but, an isolated beer, if it's a brand new beer and a beer launch on a major a uh, pub or something like that. And you're like, well, we've got this new beer called Cajal beer, right? Okay. It's just come in and it's a stout beer that replaces Guinness. And you can't believe how many people are ordering this. They're just coming in in droves and droves and droves, just like the people watching this YouTube channel. They're coming in, they're coming in, they're coming in, they're coming in. So what do you think the buyer's going to do? The buyer's going to keep ordering more so that the stock replenishes and their baseline of their stock was actually floats up. Now, this is a complex decision because there's the restaurateur who's outlaying the capital. There's the person that's working who's balancing this. And they're saying, well, we do run the risk that next week, we all get hit by a bus. And then what happens if all these people go back to Guinness and I'm stuck with all this beer? It's, there's so many factors in this that it, it, to me, it reeks. It reeks of not beer. It reeks of like an incomplete thesis, an incomplete hypothesis, guess at what's actually going on. I, so I, the, I, the over, you're more describing the overreaction bias. The, the, the uh, waiter uh, reordering the steak uh, example is the other bias, the forgetting the supply line, which you've already ordered. Um, and, and I, yeah, and I get, yeah, it's tricky business when you have a, a sudden jump because of, you know, the rock endorses or Kim Kardashian endorses something or, or whatever. And suddenly everybody wants it. Right. The Taylor Swift endorses it. So everybody suddenly wants it. So that's a different thing. But the other thing you would see, the other kind of sort of funny example of order, forgetting that you've already ordered something and reordering it as elevators. You press the button to order the elevator car and there's a delay. It's not here yet. What does everybody do? They go up and press the button again. Yeah, so but I mean, it's, it's, like, it's already ordered. It's coming. I know, but it, it reeks of of like oversimplification of somebody that is actually a rational human being. And, and so what that they push that button? We're not talking about somebody that's spending company money. And I think we're focusing on the on the on the wrong bias. The actual reality is that there's responsible people in place that are actually making calculated and informed decisions. And so there's high degree of rationality in there. But at the same I would time, agree with this is how the systems that makes part. Their response, not saying anybody's purposely doing something wrong, but human nature being what it is. Uh, and not, by the way, not everybody who plays the game really overreacts. 
Uh, some some do a lot, and others are more, much more um, cautious or whatever. And then you get into, you know, you're playing this game in real time. You, you, people don't have calculators. They're not running, you know, um, uh, a time series analysis to try and forecast. Or use, for today, you'd use AI to forecast. So, you, but that comes after the game. It, the game is intended to stimulate thinking, right? It's not intended mm -hmm. to be truth or something. And you say, well, how would we redesign the system? And you might say, hey, this is tough. When there's a jump in orders, it's intended to shock the system like the airplane's flying along and a burst of wind hits it, right? Now there's a shock. How are you going to deal with the shock? Well, if we had better tools to better predict um, order streams, and is this a one-off one kind of thing or, or a fad or whatever, uh, then we would, you know, the system would behave better, right? So so I, I guess so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you that that responsible people trying hard uh, are, you know, sometimes have to deal with these very complicated, you know, is this a fad or is Kahal going to get not show up next week? Or is, or he takes his name away from I, I, I would say that stock markets we... are much more of a path dependent system, right? Stock markets are as opposed to what, what you're talking about. Anyway, Steve wants to come in and say something and then we yeah, look, I'm gonna, gonna, I want to I want to finish about get back to Carl. I want to actually talk about econocracy, Carl, because Wow. That's a book which I think is very important. It's been forgotten to some extent. But back to just before I do that, uh, the way the way that system dynamics came about was because of these sorts of fluctuations inside a factory. Forrester was approached by a factory that couldn't understand why it had such severe cycles in its output. And they were thinking it was because of the external orders. And then he went in and looked at all the time lags that existed between various stages of a product being uh, invented, uh, designed, made, Produced, man, uh, shipped, and then and then marketed, and he said it's your internal structures that are causing that fluctuation, not the external environment. So system dynamics actually grew out of a situation very much like what the beer game is trying to simulate. But Carl, tell us about econocracy, because that was a your first um, major writing, I think, with three colleagues. And I have mm. to say, of all the books I've read, which are written by more than two authors that's probably one of the best written ever i wouldn't if i hadn't been told there were three authors i would have thought there were one so i want you to explain how you did such a brilliant job of bringing together different voices so well yeah that, thanks very much I really tell about enjoyed, the, 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 I, I really enjoyed the hey there hmm. we go i really enjoyed the supply chain debate yeah. there um so so uh yeah it, it was so we started writing it so i um we in manchester we started this society and it was called the Post-Crash Economic Society. And we, we started it precisely because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, which was that we didn't really have uh, a, a very relevant or, or interesting education. It was all very abstract and theoretical. So post-crash economics, right? Like we, we are post the financial crash. Why aren't we seeing it on the, on the syllabus? And uh, it's a pretty simple question. But that uh, eventually... Uh, and the post-crash economic society still exists today by the way it's, it's managed it's had some very good staying power for a student organization um, yeah it's it been has. around for over over a decade now and um it also turned into rethinking economics which is now a registered charity and there are groups like post-crash economics all over the world um now now there are groups you know in in, in uganda and guatemala as well as in uh you know the uk europe and the states um and there are groups in vietnam as well and uh and, and japan so it's really it's really a great movement but it it uh we got offered the opportunity to do this book because what we actually did was we did a curriculum review at manchester so we went through some of the major core modules and we evaluated them based on basic pedagogical criteria did they uh, enable critical thinking was there uh, you know empirical stuff uh, historical stuff basically did the real world have a place and we found that they did really badly most of the core modules and then we yeah. got offered to expand that into a book which looked at curricula not just at Manchester but across the um, across the country so it's all, it's all based in the UK but we did this very um, intensive audit I suppose you could call it of the courses at seven Russell Group universities. Um, don't remember which ones they were now, but uh, I think Manchester, LSE, Cambridge, Exeter, Sheffield. I can't remember, um, and a couple of others. But 
we, we managed to get hold of all the course materials, all the past exams because we had so many student groups because obviously the universities weren't going give to give them to us. Uh, uh, so yeah, we had all that and we evaluated them again a little bit more methodically uh, based on those criteria and again just found that you know, uh, as, as we summarized it, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that you can go through an economics degree without once being asked to venture an opinion. Um, you know, you just don't take a question like the Great Depression. What caused the Great Depression? There's room for reasonable disagreement about that, right? You know, you can you can think about uh, the exact causes, um, how different policies played into it, what got us out of the Great Depression. Was it more fiscal? Was it more monetary? I think there's room for reasonable disagreement uh, for that, but you would never get asked a question like that. So that was the curriculum review, and that was kind of how it happened. Now, what then happened was we were like, okay, why does why should anyone care about this right this is like a you know a curriculum review of the degrees at a bunch of universities in the uk the people like is this just going to be like a paper uh for a few academics to read uh you know if you did a curriculum review of i don't know archaeology uh would people be interested in it and we realized that obviously the the which is now obvious in hindsight, the reason that this is so important is because economics affects everyone, because economics is so yeah. widely used uh, in the world. It's, it's the language of policy debates. Economists are employed extensively by governments as well as the private sector. And it's, you, you know, it, economists appear on the, on the news all the time. There's all, we're always focused on things like GDP, inflation, unemployment, economic quantities. You need to understand this to really be a participant in political debate. It seems so uh, we, we decided to call the kind of society where economics played such a prominent role in politics and econocracy, right? Uh, like, uh, you know, like a democracy, but econocracy. Like a theocracy. Yeah, or a theocracy, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people find the word econocracy hard to say, um, but we decided it would be- Not as hard as your first theme. name. Well, no, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Say it's, it with uh, an Irish accent. Say it with, it. say, yeah, <laughs> econocracy. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> economic yeah. Scottish accent. I should have picked it up. Yeah, but mid, right. mid, uh, mid country, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so that that was just that was just the book, and that was like how we kind of motivated it, and then tried to broaden it to to tell people why should you care about the curricula mm. uh, at Russell Group universities in the UK. But it turns out you should because when a bunch of people go into these important positions with an education that's completely inadequate, then they they're, they're going to make some pretty uh, lackluster decisions and that's been so. the history of england ever since yes mike <laughs> so I, i'd like to toss a question to kahal um it, it's in the behavioral economics realm uh it seems to me that of all the various cognitive biases and what have you that people uh employ when they make their actual decisions in economics i believe the most important one is the formation of expectations and in heterodox economics and post-Keynesian economics, as everybody knows, we, we deal with uncertainty and non-ergodic systems rather than ergodic risk in systems. Hmm. But so many economic decisions are made based on expectations. Rational expectations are ridiculous, in my opinion. Adaptive expectations doesn't get us that much farther down the road. I've done some behavioral expectation modeling with uh, anchoring and adjustment. But if you read Keynes's chapter 12 on, on, on his beauty contests, mm. like, wow, it can <laughs> expectations in an uncertain world are really hard to to model and capture. And yet I think they're so important. So what is your view on expectation formation and its its modeling and its role in uh, in economics? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's it's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. Um, it goes back to the, this this rational expectations, and this this was like one of the things that we were learning, right? These models with completely rational expectations, and like Steve said earlier, rational means clairvoyant. It means able to predict the future. It means you know all of the future possible states of the economy and adjust your behavior accordingly based on those probability distributions that's not rational it's, it's just it's just uh completely counterfactual it's prophetic of, of, it's prophetic but it's yeah. just like it's completely ridiculous right there's absolutely no way anybody can um can know can can know anything even approximating that about the economy um 
So I mean, my I mean, my view of expectations. I'd, I'd love to I'd love to sit here and tell you that I have a, a really well uh, formulated mm. view of how people uh, create their expectations. I can only really tell you that I, I definitely don't think that they're rational. Um, but I think I think one of the things about like fundamental uncertainty and Kane's beauty yeah. contest. So just in case anybody listening doesn't know what that is, I might just explain. So it's, he said uh, a beauty contest where your uh, people are basically not just guessing the answer to how, uh, not just putting forward the answer, sorry, to rating how beautiful someone is in a newspaper, right? What they're actually doing is they're trying to guess what other people's answers are. But then what you get is actually, it's not that you're just guessing what everyone else's answer is, it's that you're trying to guess what everyone guesses the answer of everyone else is going to be, right? So you reach like a kind of third degree, right? Of like, uh, not just like, what do I think? And not just what do other people think? But what is everyone going to think, right? Uh, and knowing that everybody else is thinking this, so yeah, this this is the beauty contest, right? Um, yeah. And my yeah. my inclination with this is all, and it goes back to what we were discussing right at the beginning with the behaviorist stuff, is just that when given the this fundamental uncertainty, right, the, and and complexity, and the fact that we really really don't know what's going to happen in the future, even even with probabilities. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that's where you get people just people just falling back on like much more simple rules, right? People use really simple rules, and the psychologist Gerd Gigerenza is really good on this, right? He's um, kind of toes the line between that irrational rational divide that we we were discussing earlier, where he's like, you know, people will people will just take a very obvious cue, um, a very obvious cue in 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 their in their environment, right? Or they'll, they'll like, for instance, the most obvious one is just copying what the person next to you is doing uh, because that's good enough. That's literally, you know, what you go into it, you go into a room and everybody's silent. Uh, you probably think, oh, God, OK, everyone's probably everyone's silent for a reason. Maybe I shouldn't, you know, play the trumpet or something. Right. So it's just uh, I think that's, that's why we just. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it down the tone, Steve. Um, but yeah, like uh, literally. Uh, so I'm Australian. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we um, we just we just fall back on these fairly simple rules. And Giga Renza's works really good right on like what kind of rules are, are best for us to use what kind of simple rules and not just like optimizing mathematics, what kind of simple rules can make predictions and things like that. So, um, I mean, that would be my answer. I hope it answers your question. Uh, yeah, so well, it's, a, it's I've, a sticky I've, wicket, right? It's, go ahead. Well, hold on a second, guys. We're but, about but 10 minutes. Hold on, Steve, just a sec. We're gonna actually get Gahal to, to in his, in his um, most uh, okay. egregious Irish accent, we're gonna, get, we like to ham things up here. <laughs> okay. So in your most egregious, um, flamboyant Irish accent, I'm gonna bring up the top chatters and and Gahal, this is your chance to let loose. Go ahead and and, and all, read the top all, chatters. All of them. <laughs> all of them in yeah, that, all of that them. special accent. Cabin yeah. mm -hmm. Economics, Thomas Surdish, Dave Folks, Web Freaks, Community Wealth Candidates, Douglas Dow, JD. Chef Cock Alfred, Algorithm, Voting for Biden, Joe Polito, 21st yeah, Century yeah. Poet, Tom Roberts, Rebel County Socialist, MC, Steve Fitt, TR, TR, I should say, <laughs> uh, Dave <laughs> Collins, Jovian Orr, Raffle, Stephen Hinton, Wayne McMillan, Blue Bye. <laughs> That's got Australian there. <laughs> this, this it is was. getting harder and harder. This is getting harder and harder. Ghost mm. on the half shell. Andrew Sullivan. Larry Summers. Good one. Owen Wall. Danger Zone. Man Oren. David Wilkie. Phil Waller. Yeah, 7598. Petrified Produce. Tony Wilson. Apple Scab. Baba Jones. Lana Del Hates the Clock. Economics in One Lesson. Bob Leori. Wow, that's that's, good. that's really good. You know, Kahal, you. I like the accent there. It was the accent <laughs> was great, but you know what? I have to point out that was entirely an example of that confirmation bias because you had just watched the norm of going. <clears throat> 
Mike Brzezicki, Steve Keen. It has never happened on that show except for what you witnessed first, and you participated in that sort of left to right. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Determined yeah. Read it exactly the same way. <laughs> Why? Because so, you didn't... actually, I'm going to I want to dive into diving with on the expectations because I was going yeah. to bring up a couple of quotes here to give you an idea of what it's like. Because people talk about rational expectations. But have you ever read the original paper that gave us rational expectations? John Muth's paper? Muth. Muth, yeah. Okay. Here, here, here is Muth. The hypothesis asserts three things. One, information is scarce and the economic system generally does not waste it. You mm. can stop right there because if you say something is scarce according to neoclassical theory, it has a price. And if it has a price, you don't buy an infinite amount of it. You buy it up to the point at which the marginal use, marginal utility of more information equals the marginal cost of acquiring it. So therefore, according to neoclassical theory, it's rational to be irrational. Now, is that what they did? Bullshit. They simply assumed information is scarce and free. Now, you find me a planet on which that applies, and you might find neoclassical economics working. And if you want to go to somebody we all like rather than the nonsense of neoclassical, uh, the word that you have, just, just to check and see what you guys know of Minsky. What's the word Minsky uses before the word expectations? Unstable. Yeah. Hey, I have one here. Is it unstable? No, oh. I should have. I should have put a bet down here. Euphoric. Oh, okay. oh euphoric. So what he yeah, talks right. about is expectations expectations changing through a cycle. So he said, if you start in a, in a slump, everybody thinks the slump is going to continue. So what then happens is people are very conservative in what they put forward as, as policy, as, as investment proposals. You'll only put forward for a bank for funding or for equity finance, really conservatively estimated projects. Now, because they're conservatively estimated, most of them succeed. And then what happens is people say, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd put more had more leverage, we would have made more money out of that game. So expectations well, yeah. shift from being depressed to euphoric and cycle and so on and so forth. So what you've got in Minsky is a realistic understanding of expectations formation. He's really taken Keynes's idea and made it into a systemic uh, uh, attitude as to how expectations shift over time. So that's, and this is the, Carl, you talked about the gap between what economists do and what people think economists do. Mm. And people mm. like Minsky actually do what people think economists do. They go and ask banks how do they operate. They go and talk to people in, in boardrooms and work out how their behavior shifts. So the realistic stuff comes out of the post Keynesians, generally speaking, because they're the ones who go and ask the questions. Yeah. Mm. So if I can, uh, that, was, that was actually quite good, Steve. Um, that was great. Let me pose oh, one other thank you. question that I had here. Well, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm sincere. Believe it or not. Let it is due when it's due. I yeah. have I have one other one. I've got I an advantage. I've been saying got an advantage. I'm here at beer time, but I haven't had any beer. But I'm trying to behave like I've had a beer. There okay. you go. Yep. So uh, you. I want to put another one on on uh, Cahal's plate, uh, just because he's a more of an expert than I am on uh, behavioral economics. But mm -hmm. another one that I think is very important, another bias or aspect of human decision making that's important for economics is risk assessment. And I, I was first motivated to think about begin thinking about this by one of my colleagues who's a psychologist. And uh, he did his original work uh, in the state of Colorado, which if you're familiar, has lots of mountains and so forth. And because of the terrain, homeowners have a problem with radon gas in their basements. So it's a poisonous gas. And if it's just it's, it's, you don't detect it uh, by odor or anything like that. And you can be breathing it and get lung problems and what have you. So the state wow. of Colorado, as a, um, as a policy, uh, offered free radon testing kits to any citizen who wanted it. And you basically you open it up and leave it out for, I don't know, a week or something. And it absorbs radon gas if there is any. Then you put it in a... a a stamped self-addressed envelope kind of thing, and you send it into the uh, a lab and for free, they'll test it and tell you if you have a radon gas problem in your basement or your, your cellar. Well, you would think darn near every homeowner would get one of those because it's a problem and it's free, but only a small fraction of the population of homeowners bothered to get the free kit. Of the people who bothered to get the kit, only a fraction put the, the sensor thing out. Of the people who got the kit, put the sensor thing out, only a smaller fraction sent it in for testing. 
And of the people who did all of that and the people who had radon, nobody did anything about it to vent it. Mm -hmm. So you're like, what's going on here, right? It, this is like an important problem, but people obviously it's with smoking or right? their seatbelts, they're assessing the risk and they're making some sort of, of judgment that seems irrational, yet people do it. So I'm wondering if what your, uh, your thoughts on uh, that sort of bias, or if you think there's something for economics that people are doing that's more important than let's say that one. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my behavioral economist answer, which is quite individualistic, but I do think it holds some water in this case is one thing's for sure. I don't know. I don't, as I implied earlier, I don't like doing behavioral economics in the way that's like, you know, everyone's irrational and we need to correct their behavior. But one thing is for sure, we are absolutely terrible with probabilities. We, we really are bad as humans with probabilities. And you can, there's loads of people, uh, you know, Giga Renza, for ex instance, really disagrees with Kahneman and Tversky about the prevalence of biases, how biased people are, how wrong they are. But he agrees we are really bad. And you can give questions to doctors about the efficacy of a vaccine and you can give them like the efficacy of a vaccine, the number of people in the population, the number of false positives, the number of false negatives, and then say, you know, so how many people are going to have a false positive? Um, and, and they'll just get the answer wrong, like quite, quite consistently. So it, it, it does seem to be persistent for everybody um, and low probability events, especially. So I think, I mean, the, the, or, well, there's one thing. The first thing is, is it a low probability event? Um, but I think it's clear that people are thinking of it as one, right? Like they're like, they, we, we do have this tendency to be like, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, we don't really, yeah. Or, or this, this really low probability, probability event is basically as good as, as no probability. Uh, so behaviorally, that's probably what's going on there. The other question I would ask, and this is something that like I've, I've, I've written about, um, more in the context of climate change, but I actually just repeat, released a paper about the limitations of like green nudges um in 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 affecting uh pro-environmental behavior but how, i mean how easy actually was that process to get one because literally every step you put on you know uh between the person uh deciding they're gonna do it and actually be doing it and you know reporting the results and changing something that literally every step every transaction cost that you put between them and, and actually completing it is going to take out like you know <laughs> another 20 percent of the population right. but you said the way you described it it was stages right and the more stages the, there's just no way people yeah. Yeah. do it it's yeah. just inertia really right but i wonder if it was just too tricky a process to be honest yeah, that, that, that could be it. But it, it's, a, it's a curious thing. And, and again, the, the whole risk assessment goes more broadly than that particular example, mm -hmm. right? That people, they, you know, with like with wearing a seatbelt or smoking or, or whatever, there's the, the classic examples that they they just have some, the, the evidence is quite clear, like it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt, right? <laughs> and some people just don't do yeah. it. When I, when I first yeah. drove in America, it was way back in the late 90s, um, the car I hired had an automatic seatbelt. It was actually you hop in the car, turn and turn the engine on, and the seatbelt drags across your body. And the thing it was it was so difficult to get Americans to voluntarily have their freedom constrained by having to put on a seatbelt that they built it into the car, which I thought that it might be the only way to work around it. Now, I think apparently Americans do wear them voluntarily these days, but that certainly wasn't the case in in '96. On the radon, ra radon gas is an off is, is a radioactive product of radium, is it not? I think it's radioactive. Yeah, it's due to the geological. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I can't help saying, I'm sorry, is this where Rocky Mountain High comes from? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm John Denver. Oh, <laughs> my. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I, would, I heard this concept from uh, um, Brett Weinstein and on his show, uh, Dark The Dark Horse podcast with Heather Hang. And he's yeah. identified that a. a um, small changes are what's needed to drive behavior. And this is where ideological framings are so dramatic in their change. Then um, it, I think it comes back to what, what Mike's saying about path dependency. Um, and I think it comes back to what everybody's saying about discounting risk, especially with the time bias moving into the future. Right. I mean, and the, 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 I guess the most prevalent example is, you know, safe for retirement. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, when I get there one day, well, boom, all the people who are in the upper age brackets are going to say, Ed, come sat you really, really fast. 
And then back to what Steve was saying several, several shows ago is that even with your head in system dynamics and your expertise as a, as a, as a world leading economist, post Keynesian economist, you still admittedly do not intuitively understand um, exponential behavior. You have to look at the program yeah, in do. order to derive, holy shit, this is what's happening. And that's one of the great weaknesses of trying to bring it all down to the individual level as well, because it presumes the individual have the capabilities to do the analysis at the systemic level. But one of the classic statements, as you'd know, is that one about the hum humanity's great failing is the inability to understand the exponential function. And we just don't think that way. We think in a very linear way. And yet the world is, was exponential. So um, the classic is, and this, this is work by Tom Murphy, who's somebody I want to have on the program at some stage as well, the physicist Tom Murphy, who, of course, by training, has to understand exponential functions. And he makes the point that completely leaving aside global warming, completely leaving it out of the question, simply the, the second law of thermodynamics and the energy that we're, we're using in our production process on this planet, that energy has been growing since 1650 at 2.9% per annum. And he said, what about if it grows at 2.3%, which of course is therefore less than the historical average, a 2.3% annual rate of growth of something means it increases by a factor of 10 every century. He says, you go, so one century is 10 times, two is 100, three is 1,000, and four is 10,000. And at that basis, if we continued growing our energy consumption at 2.3% per annum, the waste heat generated by the sheer thermodynamical principle, second law, in 417 years would raise the temperature of the globe to 100 degrees Celsius. So mm. now that gets I, in your I, head. Forget about expert continued growth on a finite planet. Yes, mate. The, the way I the way I, I teach the kids about ex exponential growth to get them going is I take a piece of paper and I fold it in half. Oh, yeah. The thick the thickness is twice it's twice as thick. I fold it in half again. It's twice as thick again and so forth. You keep folding it, right? It's gro the thickness is growing exponentially. And I ran the I have the simulation. I say if I fold it a total of 42 times. Now at some point you can't really do it, but if I was able to fold it 42 times, how thick is the paper? And you ask the kids, and they'll say a foot, a yard, a meter. Somebody will say a mile, and the whole class will laugh. What's the answer? It's around 250,000 miles thick if you folded it yeah. 42 times. I only folded it like four times here. You reach, you reach the, the moon. Power of exponential you reach the growth. moon. Yeah. Yeah. To reach, yeah. That's why I did it, to reach and, the moon. Yeah. 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 And that's that's the failing that we just cannot think in that sense. And, you know, you, you didn't need to know that to throw a spear at the, at the local um, mammoth running past. It's uh, it, it's it isn't part of what we have to understand, but it's the world we've created. And our biggest failings are the inability to realize that this is the, the social system we've created with this emphasis upon growth is living in an exponential world, not a linear one. And therefore, we simply cannot continue doing this stuff in the way that all economists blase assume that you can. All right, Even guys, if you I, look at Mike, I, I want, I'm going to pause because I'm going to give you a challenge, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get if we can get some more likes, because we're right at a threshold here of likes. If we can get some more yeah. likes to 700, okay, we can get 700 likes next week. Mike's going to wear a hat. Did you accept the what? challenge? Next week, a what? hat? Oh, a hat. a hat. Yeah, I'll wear a hat for 700 likes, sure. Yeah, okay. All right. Any particular kind of hat? <laughs> well, okay, we like to ham it up Touch. on the show, right? So, I mean, the funkier, the better. Oh, all right. Well, okay. I'll have to think about I probably have some weird hat. Okay, I'll think about that. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, we got to watch those li that like button. And come on, guys. Yeah, come yeah. on, guys. We, we, we we actually we actually want exponential uh, performance on the on the viewership here. Carl, yeah, I want to go back to when you and I actually viewers, physically yeah. met. Yeah, I'm going to go back to when you and I physically met, which was in Manchester in 2014. Do you remember? 
was it at your uh, debate in Manchester? Was that the first time we physically met? Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, have a bit of a chat about that because that, that'll give people a flavour of what it's like to be trolled by a mainstream economist. <laughs> trolled. <laughs> trolled. So, so uh, full disclosure, Peter, who you debated, is also uh, a friend of mine. <laughs> and I've actually spoken to him on the He's camera. a good bloke. He's a, yeah. He's um, a good bloke. I mean, I'm not going to knock him as a human being. He's a nice guy, I agree. I made a video of that, and I was surprised about how vicious uh, a disagreement could get. Did you did you did you think it was? You vicious? ain't seen nothing compared to what I've been through. <laughs> wow. you, 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 people, are, economics has very vicious debates, and I've been in quite a few, as you can imagine, over my time. The bloke that they got from the department that you do to debate me was actually a very nice guy, but he wasn't really an economist, was he? He's, he's sort of. Um, what was his actual I mean, I don't think academic the background? Ma the macro economists really no, none of the macros yeah, yeah, came and no, they no micro they and wouldn't do it. So it was it was only because Peter's like a, a micro economist, which these days and I mean he's I a nice guy. This, so you, you I know. fit this category as well, really. Like these days, it kind of means like a a statistician almost, right? You're like a you do mostly econometrics, right. yeah. you do mostly applied data, and it could be you could be looking at the effect of you know. Uh, Victorian, uh, uh, you know, chimney um, types on on the uh, lung disease in the local area, right? Which isn't strictly really economic. Yeah, so that's just the type of thing that people look at. So it's not necessarily uh, directly related to economics, and certainly not to the questions like you know financial crises, uh, business cycles, money debt, whatever. Right. So so yeah, yeah. it was like. Um, but I I yeah that was I I didn't know that was the first time I met you in person. But yeah you. You came up, and then we had this uh, big debate in a in a big in a pretty big theatre. It was very it was very full, I think. Um, and it was uh, was it can economists predict financial crises? I think that was the title. Something uh, like that. But that, yeah. that that's why the bloke who they had we could really well, he wasn't in a position really to debate me. It was a bit frustrating in that sense. But he's a nice guy. Yeah. But yeah, the, the in, unwillingness to confront issues. Yeah, I, I just I, think you, they, you, they weren't. The, it was it was a shame that there were no macroeconomists doing it. Um, to be honest, but that's I mean, economists don't they don't do that. They don't do debate, you know. And uh, I, I remember reading a, a blog post about how the the it just looked at terms like rejoinder and reply and how they declined in economics journals. Right, so there's no longer a debate. It's much more. I've done a thing using the accepted methods. Here it is. It could be economics or it could actually be something completely different, like a Victorian chimneys. But right. And it's like you don't have that kind of discussion as much anymore, uh, which I think is a real shame. But maybe that explains why they just weren't really willing. Peter was the only one willing and he obviously wasn't a macroeconomist. Um, but it was uh, I don't know. How yeah. do you feel that debate yeah. that debate went uh, on the substance? Do you just think it was not? I, it wasn't particularly worthwhile. I mean, <laughs> the reason that I wanted to come up and do the talk was because I always admired you guys for sticking your necks out and forming a, a rival society. The whole post-crash mm. economic society was real courage by a group of students. And it's that's the first time anything like that had been done at a university since I did it in 1973 back at Sydney University. And one little anecdote you might not know is that there's a Manchester link because you guys did at the University of Manchester, the conservative asshole who came out to Sydney University and turned our economics department from the sort of progressive Keynesian humanist that it was back in the, up to the 1968, 69, when Bruce Williams turned up. Bruce Williams brought in two very conservative neoclassical economists uh, to teach and take over the subject. And Bruce Williams was a professor of economics at Manchester University. It can all be traced back to Manchester. So it's all, it's all their fault. It all goes back to Manchester. <laughs> yeah, that, that's where manufacturing in many ways began, and it's where manufactured ideology also began. <laughs> yeah, that's See, quite Steve. Let's give a let, let's give a plug for you, Steve, on um, because I, I want you to to kind of bring everybody up to speed about how and to what extent you predicted two thousand eight. Well, I my. I predicted it in a sense since what actually happened in 1992, because if you look at the paper I read in the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics and published in 1995, and there's a story behind why it took three years for the paper to be published. Uh, I'll tell Mike that later. <laughs> you have to guess who who was responsible for the long time delay. Um, but I, the model was included was model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and that in, it generated 
a set of cycles which diminished and then rose afterwards and leading up to a crisis. And that was such a striking phenomenon that I said, uh, do I know Frank Stilwell? Frank Stilwell is why I'm a non-orthodox economist, one of my best friends. And uh, he's the one who exposed me to the first hole in neoclassical economics. There was a question from, uh, uh, who was that? The PE 101 a moment ago. Anyway, um, so I built the model in 92, 95, and then in, I then got caught up in writing, you know, doing my PhD and uh, doing and, write, and writing uh, debunking economics. And I got involved in a fight in micro, in fact, over the theory of uh, competition. So I didn't look at the economic stuff over the macro for ages. And then I got asked to write an expert witness report on predatory lending in Australia, where some poor bastard who used to be an employee was then, the company was shut down. He was forced to be a self-employed contractor, so the, the, the garbage people who pushed him into the gig economy. And he got a house loan, housing loan, and he then failed six consecutive housing loans, all from one uh, predatory lender. And uh, then the seventh loan, they took his house and we fought to get the seventh loan reversed. So I went back to looking at the level of private debt, which is what was driving my Minsky model. And I made a throwaway comment, this comes back to the word exponential, a throwaway comment while I was writing my expert witness report that the debt to GDP ratio has been rising exponentially. Now as an expert witness in Australia, you're, even though you're paid for by one side, you're effectively an employee of the court. So you can't say anything which isn't empirically backed. So I thought, well, I'll look at the empirical data. It won't quite be exponential, but it'll be rising and that'll be okay. So I sat down, I wrote a mathematical routine to do the estimation of Australia's data rather than using an Excel spreadsheet, plotted the data and my jaw fell off. The correlation coefficient between the actual debt to GDP ratios, so not the level of debt, the ratio of debt to GDP, the correlation with a, with a, with a strict exponential was 0.98. And I went, holy shit, what's the American data look like? It was 0.92. And I went, Jesus Christ, first of all, the word's justified. And B, this trend can't continue. When it does break, and I could see the data, it was the highest level of private debt since World War II. I didn't have data before then. Uh, it's going to break. There'll be a crisis. Somebody has to warn about it. It has to be me, in Australia at least. So that's why I got into making the warning. So I first published a warning about it in the media because I knew I couldn't get a, a journal paper refereed in time in December of nineteen of, of 2005. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kahal, what's your next? What's your next? Can you tell us. You tell us about your um your work situation because. Yeah, you're, you're, you're being me very much younger than I was when I turned into me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we were just chatting about it uh, b before before we went live, weren't we? But I've uh, recently started yeah. doing YouTube Share set, with the audience. Uh, full time. And uh, so, yeah, my, my channel, just in case anyone doesn't know, is called Unlearning Economics. And um, I started that during COVID, like, like a lot of people. I kind of started up YouTube and it seemed like there was a bit of a gap for what you might call progressive economics uh, that was done, you know, with uh, um, using sort of uh, proper methods and evidence and stuff and was progressive and mm. not kind of some of the Austrian stuff that you see, which I don't think is really very good uh, and not mainstream and also, you know, not just sort of Marxism. Um, but I thought, you know, he heterodox economists, post Keynesians, institutionalists, we have a lot uh, to offer and i don't think anybody was really putting it out there so anyway that that was when i decided to make the channel uh but i was also working at lse in the psychological psychological and behavioral science department at the time uh, which was my first job after after my phd at manchester and uh, i was doing that while while doing the youtube channel but it wasn't until uh late last year that i finally decided to take the plunge and now i'm like fully self-employed um and yeah, just just doing this full time, this and book writing, um, and you know, trying to make a living. But it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty tricky. Uh, there's there's a lot of uncertainty about about your income. I think uh, it's, it's yeah, it's it's something. That there is you, unfortunately you waited yeah, to take the plunge, didn't you, Steve? And uh, I guess that you probably had a bit more stability um, when you decided to do it than, than well. I do. Well, I don't know. No, my. my Mine was a bit different. I mean, I should, by the way, I must say, guys, we're in envy mode here because I've been had my channel on YouTube, I don't know, 15 years. Yours, how, how long has yours been around, Carl? Uh, four, it's almost four years now. Almost four, yeah. Okay. 
you have 187,000 subscribers, mm. which yeah. is extremely impressive. So do you make mm -hmm. any revenue out of it? Like, Because I gave up on YouTube for making revenue a long time ago. Yeah, so you, you've got like the, um, you've got the ad revenue that just comes straight through YouTube. And I didn't enable that until actually like a couple of years in because I'm an idiot. Uh, so it doesn't actually change anything. It's just that you connect it to your bank account. Uh, I think you have to be above a thousand subscribers and above a couple of maybe other metrics and hours watched or whatever yeah. to enable it. But then you start to get revenue just sort of passively from watches and clicks on the, the adverts that show on YouTube anyway. So yeah, there's that. And then there's Patreon, obviously, which is like uh, pretty nice. It's really is guaranteed income. Um, it's the most stable source. Uh, but even that kind of fluctuates, right? Because if you don't oh, yeah, release it, but yeah, for a while, um, it depends with, on the state of the economy as well, right? Like um, a lot of people lose their jobs and stuff and then they, they have to unsubscribe from it. But you, you have to keep up the content to keep Patreon kind of steady or, or rising, really. Um, but then there's like the in the in video sponsorships, right? Um, because I, I think, you know, truth be told, I'd probably I'd rather not do them at all. But uh, I, I don't edit my own videos. I'm crap at video editing. So I pay somebody to do that. I also pay like an animator. I pay people to do like all of the technical stuff. Right. So I, I like I, I can't do any of that. I can only write the scripts and record it. Um, so really, I, I, I need them. And um, yeah, those those kind of I've, I've done sponsors for like um, like a news website and uh, sponsors for like a, um, a VPN as well, which is a very classic YouTuber one. Right. But uh, so that that those are the main sources of income. But um, it all really just depends on keeping the content up, which is, you know, fine in a way. But it you do feel that temptation to just keep churning out low quality content, which is obviously most of what YouTube is right these days. Right. You know, yeah. react reactions or your reactions or, uh, you know, just sort of Mr. Beast copies or something like that. You see these people upload constantly. They upload constantly and like they're getting really high views and, and they're just like financially obviously must be really secure. So there is it creates that tug. I, I, I don't think it's a great system and I don't think it's that's an especially controversial yeah. thing to say. You got to you got to uh, bury yourself alive like Mr. Beast did and do economics from underground or something to get millions of subscribers. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, exactly. This is the problem. You, 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 you don't have time to do original research and that's one reason that i don't do a lot of posting mm. because when you're doing original stuff if you get distracted to post this and post that sometimes it actually helps in terms of giving you new ideas but you've got to then sit down and develop the ideas thoroughly and that takes time mm -hmm. yeah so so what i how i interpret what uh the subscribers that kahal has on his site would you say one hundred eighty thousand, steve uh, yeah yeah yeah, but that, yeah. that's a so, so Jay Forrester would always tell me or ask me, he says, why are you writing for economics journals? He said, all you're doing is writing for other economists who don't care about the economy. They just care about economics articles and economics journals. And I said, well, you know, I have to get, you know, as a professor, that's what I have to do. He said, what you should be doing is writing for the general public, the business community. He said, there are people out there that aren't professional economists who write in economics, who care about this stuff. And you've got to reach them. Now, he was telling me this before we had YouTube and, you know, really the Internet and all that. So so today we have the ability to do that, to reach out to people mm -hmm. interested in economics, economic issues. But they're not professional economists in the orthodox tradition and what have you. And when I see 180,000 subscribers, that's 180,000 people who care about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Right. And I bet you they're not all professional economists. So that gives me hope that we have alternative routes around the economics profession to get our message out. Mm. You know, as Steve pointed out, Max Planck famously said, you know, science proceeds funeral by funeral. The profession is path dependent. There's such an installed base of neoclassical economists and neoclassical textbooks and what have you to just turn that around suddenly or break it free is ridiculous. It's just not going to happen on any small time scale. So we've got to go around them. Yeah. Mm. And I think social media outlets, whether it's X, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, uh, provide hope that we can do that. I think that was a major realization as well for, for me, us at Rethinking Economics and maybe 
Steve, the sort of we can't we can't go through them, so we'll have to go around them kind of thing. And I think that's yeah, absolutely. The, the internet's yeah. been so helpful in that for that, and social media, you know, for all its flaws, it is amazing that hundreds of thousands of people uh, watch a video about economics. And my videos are long, and they're a bit boring. I'll be honest with you, like, but. I get comments saying, you know, I've taken notes on this. I've watched it most, multiple times. And I'm like, yeah. my students didn't used to do that. So this is like, it's great, <laughs> right? It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, guys, you, I you get, you know, you, I'm looking at you. You, 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 actually, you actually have in what one of them, Plant of Obsolescence Will Kill Us All. You have 748,000 views. That's my best that's performing one. Slightly, yeah. yeah, slightly more views than you actually have subscribers. Now, <laughs> I'm getting, you know, about, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, when I've, I haven't given a, a technical um, talk on the internet for a long, long time, and I haven't been recording conferences because I've been over here in Hungary for the last six months. But I was sort of disappointed to get sort of two to 5,000 views mm -hmm. when I've got four times as many subscribers. So you're doing extremely well. They're getting, in some cases, more views than subscribers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it's so. a good thing. It's a good metric that if you're getting more views than subscribers. I don't, I mean, the thing is you release no, I'm not. more frequently yet. But it also depends on the type of content. I mean, there's this guy, Alex O'Connor, uh, Cosmic Skeptic is his YouTube name. Um, and he's extre he makes extremely good videos. Uh, he's a really sharp guy. He talks about religion and, and philosophical issues. But he, he, on his normal videos, he would frequently overperform or perform roughly around his subscriber count. But he's just started a podcast, right? And um, these podcasts are really, really good. But for a long-form chat, you see his metrics drop right down, right? And he's like, he's really good, consistently good, but it's just this type of thing. I don't think you get as many views as YouTube. You're looking at a fraction of your subscriber count and they're, they're usually uploaded because they are they are lower effort than scripting a video and, and, and releasing it. They usually um, release more frequently. And I think a higher frequency usually means lower views as well. So I, it's partly the type yeah. of content, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, and the other, and this is the, I got a, we got a Sorry. question here. So um, this one's from Astrid. Mm. What is the state of microeconomics? Is the rational agent thrown out the window and replaced by behavioral econ? No, I what mean, do, I, do I, do I, I don't think, I don't think, um, I suppose those are two different questions really, but I don't think that the rational agent has been thrown out of the window entirely. It's still, unfortunately, the go -to. no, I mean, it's still a central, take center stage in economics degrees, um, including, you know, master's level and maybe even beyond, but it also, so most people will learn largely rational stuff. But if you're going to create an economic model, you know, and you're not a behavioral economist and it isn't a behavioral economics paper, the, the go to would still be the standard workhorse neoclassical model where you've got a basically rational agent. Right. And the, the economists would just argue that that's not they're not looking at irrationality in that context. They're looking at something else. So um, I think, you know, the state of microeconomics is probably better because there are more experiments and uh, there's more data, like I mentioned earlier and stuff. Um, but in terms of the use of microeconomic theory, I don't think there isn't a, there isn't, this is, this goes back to what we were saying at the start, right? There isn't a behavioral theory. There's 161 different biases that tweak the main theory. So which one do you choose? I mean, pros prospect theory, which I did my thesis on, is arguably the one that's loss aversion, like Carmen Tversky's type stuff. That's arguably the main one, but even that, there are different versions of it, right? So it's like the the rational model is is one of its one of the reasons for its staying power. One of its perceived benefits is just that it's a standard core model <laughs> that you can just use again and again, and we don't have that in behavioral economics yet. Steve. The reason that where they use it is because it cuts out uh, any arg argument of agency by the government or any non-market force, because the whole idea of rational expectations was you, each individual, has in their mind a model of the economy identical to the model that we've put you into, and hey, presto, because you have that model in your head, you completely neutralise any attempt by the government or any outside agency mm -hmm. to change the behaviour of the system. So it's actually there not because it behaves for human individual behavior at all its real function is to say the government can't do anything get out get out of the way and it's the anti-government uh, bias of neoclassical economics that's why they'll continue using it despite the fact that it's an abject failure and it doesn't describe real human beings at all there you have it uh mike what's your uh what are your so thoughts? i've i've been arguing 
um, along with some of my uh, WPI colleagues and even Jay Forrester uh, before he passed, although he, um, he didn't word it the way I'm going to word it. And I think there is an opportunity to reformulate microeconomics using system dynamics, using Minsky or the various yeah. tools that are out there. And, but you would, instead of taking a deductive uh, top down and not in Steve's sense top down, but the, the orthodox neoclassical approach of Descartes, you know, start with a theory, de derive a testable hypothesis, download a data set and see if the numbers confirm the theory. You use a David Hume inductive pattern modeling approach, right? Where you start with a case study. And we, like Forrester used to do, go into companies and you know, model what, what they do, right? And uh, the interesting thing is, real quick, is he would find out that after talking to the marketing people and the finance people and the accounting people and the sales force and the shop floor guy, that everybody was doing something that was completely, I won't say rational, but made a lot of sense, right? There was nothing crazy going on here. And the people were well compensated for doing what they did. So at each part in the system, everybody was doing what seemed logical and you know made, made sense. When you hooked everything together, the, the overall system behaved improperly. And then you could say, well, how would you redesign it to behave properly? So you could do that for various firms, various case studies, right? And then finding regularities among the cases, you'd have generic structures or real typologies. And if there were any uh, commonalities among those, those would be your general principles of microeconomics. And we would have accounting sectors and proper finance in these models, interacting with the real stuff, finding out what people really do when they, they price. Are you a price taker or a price maker? If you're a price maker, what do you do? Well, you say, here's my unit costs, and here's the markup that we historically or traditionally use. And then you tweak that with all sorts of pressures from competitor prices or whatever. That's very different from a, a neoclassical model of pricing, for example. Mm -hmm. So we can do I, that. It's yeah. just a lot of work. We have, Somebody's got to get busy and do it. <laughs> well, I, I have to think to make it three times more work for you, Mike. If I came to you and I said, I'd like to sponsor um, your students and bring a team together, and that includes Kahal and Steve Keen and yourself and whoever else you want to bring into the team. And I want to say, hey, um, let's start with Descartes. Let's start with the deductive model. Let's model it. Let's start with the, then let's move on to the inductive model. Let's model Humean. Um, and then um, what about abductive, the simplest pathway? Okay, this is the perceived simplest pathway to, I don't know if it's an end goal or whatever, but that's Charles Sanders Pierce. Okay, so you've got those three forms of, of, of reasoning, the deductive, the abductive, and the inductive, okay? Is there a way to be able to model these and see how the three systems can come together or how we can derive answers out of the three of those systems? To build a model of inductive logic and deductive logic and so forth, is that what you're? Yeah, three independent models. And then how do you get the three models to communicate to each other or derive, oh. or der um, right? Well, if you're asking, can it be done in principle? Yeah, if somebody knows those domains and can precisely define the concepts, uh, we can we can certainly model them. Uh, John Sturman has a model of um, uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolutions, for example. Yeah. All right, I'd well, like to see that. Yeah, and, and actually, there's a follow-up model, whatever. So there's a whole and a whole bunch of rhetoric around it. It's very interesting. We had one guy who would come to the System Dynamics Conference every year and show us his models of mystic experiences. No lie. He was an engineer, but he was into this thing. And, and But point is, he defined all his concepts and was running simulations of mystic experiences. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do that sort of thing, but you have to be precise in the definitions of the concepts, and then we can write equations. I guess where I'm pushing for is to say, how do you synthesize these various different um, pockets of reasoning because if you can't get the systems to talk to each other which in a in a human experience we actually do have the systems that talk to each other my deductive and inductive and abductive all kind of are part of you know one larger description of what human consciousness is so it seems to me that you know unless we're i mean it's fine to, to build out one particular form of reasoning and you know base a a, a model on inductive information gathering, but we know that's not sufficient either. 
So, I mean, the bigger question and the challenge to the discipline as a whole is to say, how do you take those three categories and how do you get those categories to theoretically, just theoretically, how would you set up the, the experiment to, to have them you know, cross pollinate and, and, and talk to each other? This, this sounds like we have to sit, uh, Steve or I, or some, somebody, one of our modelers has to sit with what a philosopher of science, uh, is this epistemology? Uh, where you get into how, knowing about Theory knowing and, knowledge. Do you think the, the, the uh, problem, the, the, the problem there, Dave, Dan, the, Dan, the problem there is that we, when you're talking about scientific revolution, you're talking about an evolutionary process. And mm -hmm. I think that's so system dynamics can do dynamic processes, but doing mm -hmm. evolutionary processes is not something that fits within the system dynamics paradigm. I'd like to see that model, Mike, mm -hmm. that Sturman model you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, I'll send you the papers. What Anybody who wants them, just fire me an email. I'll send them along. It'd be good, yeah. Final mm -hmm. little thing I want to have a quick chat with Carl, but we're running up to a close five minutes to go. Um, I met you, you guys also got Deborah Mulemas to put on a special course. Oh, yeah. uh, tell us the story about that, because that shows what economics departments are like. Yeah, so th this was, yeah, this was a shame. So we, um, uh, Deborah Mulemas, a, a lecturer at Manchester, and he, he taught, he was a, a heterodox economist, a post Keynesian, but he just taught normal macro in the, in the, in the neoclassical. Uh, way because that's what he was you know obviously had to do uh but then he he kind of joined our cause a little bit because he obviously he had some agreements with the post-crash economic society and one thing that we we got him to do was to put on a completely voluntary module in the evenings uh called bubbles panics and crashes and uh it was really good uh it was very post keynesian there was a lot of history uh, kind of charles kindleberger type stuff you know uh, going back through the history of financial crises, looking at endogenous money, some critiques of the uh, mainstream models. There's a bit of Marx in there as well. And um, it was really good. And it consistently had sort of, bear in mind, this is in the evenings, not for credit. It consistently had 20 to 30 students, you know, not just us from post-crash, but like other people as well. Um, and it was, it was uh, yeah, it was really loved. And then the the... The department said that they <laughs> they said that they'd put it on um they said that they'd they'd uh put it on as an, a real module the year after uh and then sort of uh ended up reneging on their on their promise and uh just uh allowing devrim's contract to expire instead so we thought we were going to get you know the post-crash economic society we thought we were going to get this crash module put on and we were like you know well we've we've almost achieved you know our goal if if that module's on the curriculum but uh yeah it wasn't to be sadly uh, they just sort of let him go instead and then uh, then then we d we didn't get to all that financial crises either and and i think yeah that has i mean that pattern with heterodox economists it does it does get it does get repeated you you do see it again and again sometimes it's it's even worse sometimes they you know there are his times when they've been kind of forced out much more much more uh, aggressively as well but basically you're you're not likely to get tenure if you are a heterodox economist and you're not likely to get heterodox modules taught on syllabus and, and syllabi and you're not likely to get uh uh heterodox papers published in in any major journal either well this is what that's Steve's exactly the experience years. that i had through my yeah. academic career yeah. and uh, like just a bit more background on devrim uh because devrim did his PhD at Manchester because he thought he was going to be going to a heterodox department because in the past history that was dominated by a guy called Ian Steedman, mm. who was a Shrafigan economist, yeah. and they used an input-output uh, dynamic, still equilibrium focused, unfortunately. Steve, Stephen and I had a fight over that at one stage, um, but uh, still the uh, Shrafigan very very uh, uh, non-orthodox. And then when he got there, it was all DSGE. So he built a DSGE model. He hated the shit, but he did it. So he was capable of doing highly technical mm. neoclassical work. And he worked there for eight or nine years, I think. And then after the course was put forward, they effectively sacked him. And this is what happens inside an economics mm. department. They drive not orthodox people out. So the very first thing I did when I got my position at Kingston was I hired Devrim. Yeah. And uh, the quality of the work he does now in dynamics is off the scale. And this is the sort of stuff we should be doing. And the last place it's going to happen in is a neoclassical economics department. Mm. So great job, good guys. to you guys. Great, great to you, Carl, for starting rethinking. It's marvelous. It's still going. Yeah. Any student who wants to keep their critical thoughts, join rethinking economics Please. or start one at your university. Yeah. Okay? And, and you, can yeah. thank, you can thank for Carl for the fact that it exists. Oh.
Yeah, and thanks as well yeah. to Steve for steering me uh, towards the, uh, the the criticism of mainstream economics. Uh, you know, te- it's, over, it's over a decade ago now. Jesus. Okay, guys. <laughs> I wanna, I You've wanna got no right to. Well, I'm over seventy, mate. You can't complain. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining us this week, and I want to thank our special guest. And I also want to thank Mike for volunteering to wear the hat next week. We hit our goal. Uh, we, we've got the likes. And so next week, Mike's going to be wearing a special hat and, uh, tune in next week to find out exactly what that's going to be. And, uh, have a good week. Thanks everybody.